Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms, and on the bench today we have another piece of obsolete scanner technology for your enjoyment. This is a Grove Scanverter CVR1. This is a product of the early 80s. Essentially, at this time, there were a few higher end scanners that actually had civil air monitoring capability. And mill air reception really was unavailable unless you had a pretty high end communications receiver. Being that existing scanning radio receivers at the time lacked this military aviation coverage, there was kind of a, a gap in affordable receivers to monitor that portion of the radio spectrum, and hence this device was envisioned. And this device acts as a receive converter that basically uses the existing civil aviation scanning receiver as an IF radio and through the use of this device allows that scanning receiver receiving the civil aviation frequencies to pick up military aviation frequencies which in and of itself is not an incredibly unique concept as it's been done in transverters and other technology before this device. Now what made this device unique was its ability to squeeze that 175 megahertz of military aviation spectrum into 17 megahertz of civil aviation spectrum and it was done through a concept called band stacking and I did happen to find this paperwork on the internet on it and as you can see it it's like a pre-release type of thing where they discuss it and you can read over it and you can see your cost here at the bottom is the low cost of $99.95 and if you wanted the optional AC adapter it was an additional eight dollars so at the time this was not an inexpensive piece of equipment physical construction is aluminum it's a slant based cabinet kind of typical uh, you can look it's got the frequency conversion chart and what's important to remember is is just because it like it this intersection here 118 megahertz it also says 226 if it's 118 500 it's going to be 226 500 just wanted to point that out in case someone had a question about that We've got rubber feet in the bottom of it keeps it from sliding around back side of it you have a 12 volt coax power jack and you have two jacks for the old school Motorola or DIN type of RF plugs kinda of like what goes into the back of your uh, car stereo so those are fairly typical for the uh, time that this item was produced and of course the uh, manufacturing information model number etc also of note is an LED that illuminates when power is applied to the device well let's take this thing apart and see what's inside the way it's held together is four screws, and the four screws also hold the feet on. When we remove the bottom part of the enclosure, we can get to the innards, and this is what we're presented with. Here's the board pulled out for us to look at. This side's the UHF side, and this looks like a little preamplifier. Power comes in here, protection diode. This side here, we have our mixer. Here we have our oscillator right here, and that's our tuning for our oscillator. And right here is our six pole filter. So, not a whole heck of a lot to it. And then here's the VHF output. We're going to go ahead and test the device now. Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to essentially, using my service monitor, we're going to feed a UHF signal into the device and then use a VHF receiver and tuned to the frequency over here so for example we'll start with 226 we'll take and feed 226 megahertz RF out of the service monitor and the receiver will be turned tuned to 118 and what we'll do is we'll see how the receive performance is on this device compared to just the radio itself receiving these UHF frequencies without the benefit of utilizing this. Now in order to do this we're going to use a more modern scanning receiver that actually has mill air coverage. So that will give us an idea of how efficiently this device is working. Uh, we'll need a couple of RF adapters here. These basically are just to convert the 
RF connector from this legacy type of connector here to a more standard BNC connector that my test equipment uses. And then we also have my universal power plug here that I've got properly configured to power this off of a 12 volt benchtop power supply. Here's our test receiver, just a unit in BCD 996T, and I've loaded a template into it. Uh, 118 megahertz, 124, 131, 120, 134, and 129, which basically evenly goes across the receive range of the device. And these are the mill air frequencies corresponding in the same order. 226 megahertz, 250, 275, 300, 350, and 399. Previous to our testing of the CVR1, we've tested the adapter stack, and you can see here, it seems like it's got about 1 dB of loss at this frequency, so we use that as a, uh, we'll factor that in. The test we're going to use is just simple SYNAD testing, which is signal, noise, and distortion. So we're starting out by taking the receiver and we're feeding a signal into it. We're taking the audio out of the receiver and putting it into the service monitor and it's giving us our SYNAD. Now 12 dB of SYNAD is our target, which is what's considered to be basically a signal that's understandable against the, you know, contrasting with background noise. So as we turn it up, we can see what that sounds like audio-wise. Now you can see that as we turn the RF up, how the synad goes up and it goes up to almost a full quieting signal. So just keep that in mind as we go through our testing here. Well, we can see that right now the reference amount of power being fed into this to give us 12 dB of synad is about 120 decibel milliwatts. Okay, and now we're running our signal at the same frequency through our converter and we're taking the receiver and we're having the receiver tuned to a frequency of 120 megahertz which is working as intended so it does work but you can see how much larger of a signal is required to give you the same audio quality and these are the results I came up with here on the left. You can see this is when I'm feeding the UHF frequencies directly into the receiver and the amount of signal I had to send to it to provide that result. And on the right hand side here, you can see this is how much signal I had to send to the CVR1 to provide the same level of signal. And it's easy to see that it requires a considerably larger signal to be able to provide the same kind of audio quality with this device. The device does work and it does work well however there's a considerable amount of loss in the CVR1. So what this would mean to us as a monitor if we were using one of these devices we would need to have an extremely strong signal. Is it snake oil? It isn't. It actually works well. Uh, the frequencies that are referenced on this list and on the VHF side and how they correlate with one another is uh, very accurate in my testing. The only problem is is that the device is deaf and it does reduce the received signal strength considerably necessitating very strong signals. Now perhaps in use with a, a preamplifier it would uh, that would make it a more useful piece of equipment but you have to consider that at the time something like this was extremely useful because of the lack of affordable military air monitoring equipment. So would I use it today? Probably not. I would just go ahead and buy a receiver that is already useful for mill air monitoring and trying to use this in a searching type of environment would require uh, having to go back and forth between the uh, the chart here and trying to ascertain which frequencies you're listening to so it would that right there in itself would make it uh, more difficult than just using a typical mill air receiver so uh, it is a pretty cool piece of equipment that I have in my collection and uh, I'm glad to have it but as I said before I don't find it to be extremely useful in today so I hope you enjoyed this trip down scanning memory lane. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comps. Till next time.